Okay, uh, Yale, you want to start? Thanks. Um, Even if a person for whom your kid, like your own child, regards you as an enemy, cherish him specially, like a mother does her child who is stricken by sickness. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. I read it also in Hebrew because it uh, sounds a little differently. Uh, it's, it translated a little bit differently. כאשר מישהו שהוקרת ואהבת כילדך, מפנה לך את גבו ורואה בך אויב, לאהוב אותו אף יותר, כאימא האוהבת את ילדה החולה, זהו התרגול של ילדי אגודה. So um, today we're going to do a little review of concentration because that's the verse that we're up to. And then there was a request that we look a little bit more at the object of negation and um, review the sevenfold awareness. So um, I'll just spend a, a few minutes with the concentration verse and um, it's mostly review anyway, I think. And then um, we'll go back to the sevenfold analysis and a bit more time with the object of negation. We're on uh, verse 29. So it says, understanding that disturbing emotions are destroyed by special insight with calm abiding. Cultivate concentration, which surpasses the four formless absorptions. This is the practice of bodhisattvas. So we're talking about um, the, special in, the special purpose in developing concentration on the bodhisattva path. The general purpose of concentration is to subdue or to antidote negative states of mind and suffering. You know, that's the general reason for cultivating concentration. It delays or prevents negative states of mind for ari from arising, or um, it helps you cut through um, the very root of it when it's conjoined with special insight directed on emptiness. So that's the general reason for concentration. And the specific reason for concentration in the bodhisattva context is to do that in order to be of benefit to all sentient beings by becoming a Buddha, which means you need to surpass the four formless absorptions or the four formless concentrations. And so um, we've talked about these before, but just to give us a little review, um, I made you a chart. So the desire realm category doesn't have anything underneath it um, because it's just a big mess of desire. That is what you're doing is you just want and crave and want and crave like drinking salt water always thirsty and that is where we are. And then you develop ethics and concentration and enter into the form or material realms going through the four jhanas. And the four jhanas, um, you know, are gradually abandoning coarse mental factors. Yeah, and so you're becoming much more equanimous. Um, in, a, in the balance sense, not in the immeasurable equanimity sense, but in the balance sense, a lot more ability to be one-pointed and neutral. 
you also have that blissful, rapturous sort of concentration. Going through the four formless realms or the four jhanas, or the four jhanas in the form realm, then you go on to the immaterial or formless realm. And so those had those kind of like wild, exciting, intriguing names, like infinite space, infinite consciousness, nothing at all, the peak of existence, you know, quite like provocative, interesting terms based on that very concentrated mind is focusing on. So they're named related to what their focal object is. So once you have fully fledged calm abiding and special insight, you're developing along these stages. And this verse is saying, that is not enough. Yeah, so, so you look at this chart and you go, okay, so this is all within samsara. This is all within a samsaric mind. These are the developmental stages that can happen through meditation and do happen through meditation. And it would be easy to decide any one of these was enough because your degree of immediate suffering would be much less. And your degree of immediate afflictive behavior would be much less but it would be as if you put a lid on it rather than uprooting it. So when you're not focused, they can just pop right back up again. So that's the very, you know, the quick running across sum summary of it. Um, at the bottom, it says often, but not always, these realms correspond to a sphere of consciousness, but it is possible for a human in the desire realm to have a form or formless sphere of consciousness. So you can be a form or formless realm consciousness while still being a desire realm being if you develop your meditative abilities. Okay, so this is generally review from when we did concentration. Um, do you have any, any kind of thoughts looking at that again or um, things that you've been meaning to ask about or flesh out? So, I mean, really the essence of the, of the verse is saying all of that is not enough. So <laughs> it's excellent, it's worthwhile, proceed, but don't forget that sentient beings need you. Don't get lost in the bliss of absorption. That part of the reason that we get um, absorbed by novels and we get absorbed by certain TV shows and we get absorbed by certain kinds of music is that we're starting to touch a little bit of the bliss of concentration in a very ordinary way. Yeah, but we're, you know, when you're really absorbed into whatever you're focused on, it can be quite blissful. You know, not always, but when you're really, you know, married to it. And the, the interesting thing is that it shows us how easy it is to get lost in the bliss of absorption or the bliss of concentration and forget about what needs to come afterwards or ne what needs to happen as a result of it. We're just so happy to be absorbed. You know, so in one way, it's kind of good news that shows that even at our level, if we're not amazing meditators, there's a type of concentrated absorption that we've already kind of touched and experienced the bliss of. But it also shows us a little bit how easy it is to forget about working for the welfare of sentient beings and just to kind of get lost and carried away in it. You know, so it's kind of, I don't know, good news or bad news, but just in terms of experience, do you know what, what I mean then when I say there is a bliss that comes with concentration? If you think about those times of being absorbed in something with a lot of focus, you know, there's just kind of a, a flow that happens. Yeah. And I think that a lot of our life, we're trying to chase that feeling of flow. Yeah. Or we're trying to chase that feeling of being absorbed in and absorbed with. And that chase I don't know if it's necessarily good or bad in and of itself. I think we just need to ask ourselves the question, to what end? You know, why? What for? You know, and to, to really be honest with our reasons for it and what we're directing to it. Because it's said that you can develop a type of very incredible single pointedness focusing on an object of attachment. And then you have amazing concentration, but only when it's related to an object of attachment. So then if you need to shift it and use it in order to work for the welfare of others, it doesn't have the same flexibility that you would have if you'd motivated with bodhicitta. So the mind knows how to be absorbed. The mind knows how to concentrate and the mind likes it. Yeah. So the mind likes to be absorbed, doesn't it? And I think that that liking of absorption, we don't need to label as good or bad. I think we just need to acknowledge how easy it is to fall into the tendency of chasing absorbed feelings for their own sake, like as entertainment or as 
kind of peak spiritual experiences or touching a type of oneness and unity with another and forgetting why or to what end or what are we doing it for you know and then maybe nothing needs to change particularly about your choice of focal objects it's just your reasons for it can expand to include more rather than saying i can't be focused in this way or on this thing to say okay that and rather than instead of maybe won't trigger the same kind of like deprivation mentality or hunger or rebellion of changing focus that can happen. Um, I think you probably know if you've been around children at all, if you try to move them from what they're absorbed in, right? If they're really focused and absorbed in something and you say, now it's time to have dinner or now it's time to go outside and play to rip them away from what they're absorbed in can be like a fight, you know? And so we're so used to marrying our absorption with objects of attachment because we love the bliss of it. Um, so really the essence of the verse here is to remember bodhicitta, bodhicitta, bodhicitta. And then the shifting of focal object to focal object is not going to be so jarring. We can remain in flow even when the object is different. Does it, does it make sense? Because I think we already touch a level of that already. When you're in a really expansive kind of focus, to shift focal objects is not jarring. You know, to shift from one patient to another, to one activity to another, you can kind of remain in flow. And then some days it's jarring and you have to kind of recalibrate and, you know, readjust, I'm guessing, yeah? So um, if you start with the, the right motivation, then you have more flexibility. Nathan, what is jarring? Jarring, uh, jolting, upsetting, agitating. Um, it's usually used in the context of like a car has been jarred, you know, it's been shaken, something. Yeah. So um, an interruption that's uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. So um, to kind of look at our own relationship to interruption, I think is a very interesting one here. What is our relationship to being interrupted? Yeah, because, you know, the opposite of being interrupted is being focused. And focus comes together with a type of bliss. And if that focused bliss doesn't have bodhicitta, interruption equals annoyance. But it doesn't have to. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, so just looking at our own relationship to interruption um, can help us remember to start from bodhicitta, I think. Um, Ron, you're unmuted. Um, Did you want to add something? Just to say that um, uh, the, the discussion now reminds me uh, uh, some thoughts uh, that we um, that we share about uh, empathy, uh, in the sense that whether it's an objective uh, mode of uh, observation or uh, it. Uh, it uh, um, grounded uh, in ethical, in the ethical stance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then what, what do you do with that information? Uh, for me, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very clear. I mean, uh, I don't uh, feel or I don't think that uh, it's, uh, it's one thing that, uh, that I need to kind of um, accurate for myself it's it's uh, it's um, totally two two different things concentration by itself without the ethical uh, uh, ground it's like um, it's 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 something but it's 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 completely not related to concentration where it's uh, grounded in ethical stance and the same with the empathy yeah yeah and i i think there's a level of um both depth and bliss when it's altruistically motivated you know when you're when you're focused with the intention to be of benefit there's a, a level of intensity with the focus um and a level of i feel like it's slightly different than when you're just focused in a more um neutral way or focused on something that is afflicted it doesn't have the same kind of clarity and the quality of bliss isn't quite the same but that's just something we have to feel into maybe experientially. Um, but to keep remembering that motivated by altruism 
thinking of the other is in our own best interest. You know, our own path progresses so much quicker when we're thinking of the other. Um, you know, it's, it's mutually beneficial and it's the self-cherishing that will say, your focus only, your bliss only, do that, uh, do that for now until you're relaxed and relieved and settled. And then you can shift to thinking of others again. You know, instead of doing that, you can think, I need a break so that I can benefit others rather than saying I'm taking a break from benefiting others. You know, it's a really different way of shifting the focus because of course we only have a certain amount of mental energy at our level right now. So sometimes we do need to shift to a less intensive way of being to something that's a little bit more expansive and less directed just, you know, because our mind isn't able to stay in sharp, penetrating, altruistic focus all the time. It's not able to. But if we can, when we shift out of that, think I'm resting so that I can continue rather than I'm giving it up for a minute and I'll come back to it. So it's just a different way of calibrating the mind, which reinforces what we talked about with joyous effort. To set something down and then pick it up costs more energy than to keep holding it, but sometimes hold it more lightly than others. Yeah, so you're always holding the same thing. You're holding altruism, but sometimes you're holding it very firmly focused. Sometimes it needs to relax a little bit, but to put it down, it makes it more tiring than to go and pick it up again. Does that make sense? Ish. Um, did you want to ask anything more about the, the concentration section or any of the stuff that we went over when we were looking at it? Um, that section particularly was on um, page 31 of your main text. There being the um, kind of three kinds of concentration that for um, ordinary beings, discerning concentration and that of tatagatas, to tatagas, depending on your accent. So the um, under number one, the concentration practiced by ordinary beings, the second paragraph, your mind rests in one pointed concentration, free of dullness and wildness, this state of sustained calm, shamatha, cannot lead beyond the state of absorption in the formless realms. Yeah, it can't lead beyond the state of absorption in the formless realms. It lacks the profound insight which ascertains and recognizes the ultimate nature of phenomena. So it's going in the right direction. It's very useful, but it's not yet getting the job done. It's not enough in and of itself. And many meditators in the past have taken that bliss to be nirvana when in fact it's not, let alone Buddhahood. Um, the clearly discerning concentration. In this concentration, all aspects of phenomena are examined down to their empty nature. Through profound insight, you establish beyond any doubt the lack of inherent existence of any kind of self. And meditation culminates in insight free of any conceptual affirmation. Meditating in this state, you accomplish the path that unites sustained calm and profound insight. This corresponds to the levels of path of accumulation and of joining, meaning the path of preparation. This type of concentration confers the higher perceptions and ability to benefit beings. And then the third one is talking about basically how Buddhas are able to see relative truth and ultimate truth simultaneously. So, um, so we did spend a lot of time on concentration um, in previous semesters and a little bit in this semester. So I'm happy to go back over anything you're curious about, but we can also um, just move on if you don't have more. Uh, Venerable Kartsen uh, Yaki made us a nice little um, Hebrew translation for you guys. So I've just highlighted the sections in English just to make it easier. But when you're looking at the Hebrew, does it feel more or less clear? <laughs> the sevenfold reasoning. I don't know if it's more or less clear or differently confusing. Um, to say the sevenfold reasoning stages, um, you know, it's easy to get confused and say, but it's nine points or it's 10 points. What are you talking about sevenfold? The meaning is that the first two are the preliminaries that you really need to become quite clear on. And that implicit 10th stage is the conclusion that you come to. 
So the heart of the analysis are those sections in blue. And it sometimes is easier to look at the reasoning kind of divorced from an object. And sometimes it's easier to look at the reasoning together with an object. So together with an object is the analysis of the chariot. Yeah, do you see here? <clears throat> you know, one with its parts, separate from its parts, possessing its parts, having it related to an actual object sometimes makes the concept clearer, um, but sometimes we need to separate them depending on where you're at that day. Yeah, so we'll, we'll start at the beginning, um, which is the essential of ascertaining the object to be negated or whatever that is in Hebrew. <laughs> okay, so that handout is in your message section if you don't already have it downloaded. The, the first step of looking at the object to be negated, I think that, um, you know, we've talked about it a lot, but maybe to talk about it from another angle is to ask, why is it that sometimes the self needs to be seen, validated, and understood, and sometimes it doesn't? You know, just in terms of experience, yeah? So just kind of stepping aside from the technical presentation, why is it that sometimes, like perhaps when you're traveling, yeah, when you're traveling and you're meeting lots of new people and strangers and negotiating this and that and buying this and that and walking around, maybe your sense of needing to be seen and understood just kind of fades and there's a kind of freedom that can come. Yeah, I don't know if traveling is the best example, but that's just something that came to my mind. Um, and then there are other times when it seems like a vital necessity for your well being and mental health to be seen and understood, and that you have to be, or else you're not going to let go of wherever you're at and move on to whatever's next. Do you know this? There's like kind of two different ways that we think of ourselves. And when we talk about the object of negation, of course, we are talking about that one that thinks that it needs to be seen, the one that thinks that it needs to be understood. Yeah, that very one that seems to need a um, framing and a labeling and an acknowledgement and a, I don't know, a valuing and a respect. And we all know that if you jump over that with yourself or with others at the wrong time, you can't just magically help them understand emptiness by saying that self isn't there at all. It doesn't work. You have to sit in that place for a little while, almost examine all of the corners of it and the borders of it before it can be dissolved and let go of. Um, so it's, it's interesting to me that already in our life, we have these two modes of being, identified with the object of negation and not identified with the object of negation. And what are the things that provoke the object of negation into being? So of course it's always there in terms of innate ignorance, right? We always have the object of negation, but I'm just thinking in, in terms of experience, what provokes it into being besides the obvious things that we always talk about of being praised or being criticized or being in danger or whatever. So much so that we can actually define it and look at it enough that we can see it's not there. Yeah. So the object of negation is discussed in that chapter um, on the object of negation. And it's a bit technical in some parts, but in the book on um, page 13 at the bottom, I'll just read it to you if you don't have it in front of you, but it's chapter two, page 13 at the bottom. This self is a conventionally existent I, which is imputed to the five aggregates which are its particular basis of imputation. It is the so-called base, which is empty, the foundation of the negation of inherent existence. Inherent existence itself is the object of negation. Okay, so we take the conventional and add. Yeah, we don't see the conventional. We're not ever finding the conventional. We're not seeing, okay, here's the self merely labeled on the collection. And that's me in a relative sense. And ultimately, I don't exist at all, all from my own side, etc. We never go that far. Yeah, we're always identifying with the add on on top of the convention. So Tsongkhapa explains the position of this self in the context of meditation on emptiness as follows. 
in the beginning, the yogi analyzes only the self, it is this so-called self, which is the object of the conception of a self-existent by way of its own entity or not. By way of its own entity or not, yeah. A yogi, through negating the self, which is inherent existence, destroys the false view of a transitory collection. This is done, he has turned away from all faults. So self in the term conception of a self is an incorrectly imposed mode of existence which does not exist in reality. The self which is the observed object of the conception of a self, however, is an existent phenomena. Okay, so that's, that's the part we have to just keep coming back to is there is an existent self, there is a relative self, but don't think by understanding dependent arising you've magically understood the convention. Yeah, so unpacking the add-on or unpacking the object of negation, um, you know, the chapter goes into the different ways the different tenant schools look at it. But in terms of experience, when you're with yourself, when you're, or when you're with a patient or when you're with a friend, what is the thing that makes them relax identification? You know, if you're just thinking experientially or techniques and tools and someone is very identified with something that's happened to them, something that's happening to them, something they are, something they aren't, you know, when they're really stuck and concrete and that very identity you see is a prison they've created for themselves that is keeping them locked in distress. What are the things that help them dissolve that and release back into, if not reality, release into more potential and possibilities? Because I think we can agree that the object of negation is provoked into excessive existence when it's under threat right, or when it feels neglect, and when it relaxes, or when it dissolves, or when it's less dominant, is when that same sadly false sense of self feels, you know, seen, nurtured, cared for, and so it doesn't need to yell anymore. But there's another step deeper to that, which is when you're kind of out of thinking I and me all together, and when you're just kind of living in connectedness. When you're living in connectedness, there's not such a need to assert a self. There's kind of more of an organic or a natural collaborative ability within the mind and within the person. So, you know, so I'm just kind of curious about when when someone is overly identifying with something, even if you don't call it the object of negation, you know, what, what tools do you use to help that dissolve, release, and relax? And do those techniques then wind up reinforcing the false self? Or do they wind up dissolving the false self? Because both will give a sense of immediate relief. One of them is long-term very beneficial. One of them is short-term beneficial. Do you know what I mean? So you can sort of like placate the false self, pat it on the head, they're there, you're justified in your being, and it will relax and not be so dominant and so aggressive and so out. But there's also dissolving it in such a way where you're starting to get to the very root of the issue. What helps release people back into possibility, I guess. Can you, can you explain this last thing again? I understand how when you, when you support the false self, it will dissolve. But what was the second part of what you said? Well, I'm saying that, that you can support the false self and it will kind of relax and as if dissolve and that will give a sense of relief and mental health temporarily. Or there is looking at the whole nature of over-identification in general, which then can lead to more lasting connection with possibilities, with peace, with transformation. But, you know, you can, so if you do it in the superficial way, there is still relief. There is still some sort of ease, right? But when you do it in the deeper way, then it's in a way more empowering and more long-term and more lasting. I must say a very tiny little thing. That's what human spirit is all about. So that's the idea. So somehow, 
seems to me a strange, uh, it's strange that we are not talking about it, I don't know. Well, I feel like we talk about it in this like umbrella way, but we don't talk about the specifics very often, maybe. I don't know. You know, I mean, it's like the general idea that we're all working towards, right? Long-term peace, release, satisfaction, happiness, as opposed to superficial band-aid sort of mental health pop psychology. Uh, we just don't call it false self. It's for a different ter terminology. We, we call it emergent self, never mind, the grandiose self, whatever. Yeah. And we don't take it as superficial, but we don't take it as the last uh, station in life. But the transforming one, the connecting one to the others, the world, no self-wise. Uh, so this is the whole idea. So it's parallel uh, conversation in a way. I hope so. Okay. Yontem, could you give an example how you would work with somebody on the deeper level? Um, I don't work with other people except to teach them. <laughs> I work on myself. <laughs> so how do you work on yourself on the deeper level? Let, let, just let's invent an example. Humor. <laughs> yeah, through humor. Um, I, I think, um, there, you know, things like the seven point mind training, things like the eight verses, these are things that are so familiar to me that that when I find a blockage or a sense of concreteness, often they arise just naturally because of familiarity. And I laugh myself out of my absurdity. I say, there I go, identifying with again. And yet, you know, the danger is, is that by saying, um, I'm over identified, that is not me, then I negate something too much or too quickly. And then there's like a, a ricochet or a rebellion or a backlash. So um, personally, the, 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 the dance is always between making sure I don't over intellectualize what is actually happening in experience, but at the same time being able to name the experience with my intelligence so I don't believe my own story. So it's, it's this dance between knowing what is true and then knowing what is experience and being able to negate enough of the experience of how true the self feels while at the same time not turning it into a weapon of self-harm or negating too much too quickly and having a backlash. So, you know, <laughs> it's a day-to-day, -day, it's a day-to-day -day challenge, but, um, you know, like it's in the seven point mind training, always meditate on whatever provokes resentment. You know, this is the, always meditate on whatever provokes resentment. This is, this is kind of the key mantra in my life of why this? Of all the millions of things that could irritate me or annoy me or make me sad or make me angry, why this? Why now? You know, some days the leaf blower annoys me, some days it doesn't. Why this? Why now? Who's annoyed? You know, and then this little unpeeling of these things. So, you know, I, I think that experientially what starts to happen the more you meditate on the fact that the object of negation is not there at all is that you start to feel very groundless. You know, you feel very groundless and there's no um, place to rest your feet or a place to rest your identity. And some days that is freedom and it's expansive and it's connected. And some days it's like, you know, an uh, infinite hole of ambiguity and it can be quite destabilizing. So what kind of keeps the orientation from turning fearful is to remember connection with and benefiting of others. But, you know, what happens in my own train of thought, I don't know, it probably wouldn't make sense to anyone. Taken out of context, I must seem so strange. <laughs> But don't we all? I think the whole concept of uh, being a self-object is is holding this uh, practice of uh, being there for someone else as part of their self in a way that really relaxes their um, uh, um, feeling of having to to be very uh, um, opposing to something. It relaxes something, and it's 
it's a process that we are trying to cultivate via our training in, in Buddhism because all these practices of the nine verses and the, it's uh, helping us to not be so attached to ourselves and to be really open to other people's self in a way that help, I think helps them to, to relax their uh, grasping in their self. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, this, this first, you know, statement in the um, process of going through the sevenfold of realizing the object of negation, it's just the first step. The second step is in a way more profound because it's asking if it is so solid, prove it. So to make it completely colloquial, completely divorced, divorced from Buddhist terminology, you would say, are you your history or aren't you? Are you a product of your environment and conditioning or aren't you? And go with each and assume each of them is true 100% for a minute and see the absurdity of that. And then, of course, once you think I am, I am not my history or I am my history long enough, you think, oh, obviously, then I'm a combination of both or I'm something labeled upon both. And then you go even deeper and see that it, that is also not the case. But, you know, so you're kind of going to these um, conclusions of landing on this is who I am in no way at all. <laughs> but you have to land, I am this, you know, I am my history and my genetics and my personality and my upbringing and my family of origin issues and my sense of humor and my intelligence and my education. And I am, I am, I am, I am, none of those things. But you kind of have to do all the I aming. And then when you think I am none of those things, you think, okay, well then I'm separate than all of those things. I'm holding or possessing or owning them. I'm divorced from them, but I'm experiencing them. And then that is also not the case. But you have to let yourself feel that for a moment. But Yontian, when, when we speak about karma, aren't we saying that there is a continuum that we are a result of now? Sure, but that doesn't mean it's inherent or that it's self. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And th that's really the normal, you know, that's the normal trap to fall into is to get slightly more subtle and then think that you've gone far enough. You know, and you think, oh, okay, so then I am the continuum of consciousness carrying the karmic seeds and habits. That is me. I am either it or the carrier of it. I am the container or I am the contents. And then you see that neither of those is possible inherently. You know, and so you drop down and drop down layer by layer, rather than just chasing to the end where you know you're supposed to come to the conclusion, I am empty of inherent existence. You know, you know that's the conclusion you're going to, but if you race to the end, you'll miss the experience of your own pockets of resistance and the transition points that are really vital to meet and then release and meet and then release. Yeah, so if you look at this chart again, it's look at it as sections of meeting yourself and who you think you are and then disbelieving it, but you have to meet it first, okay? So look at this one on the screen. Um, the essential of ascertaining the object to be negated, the essential of ascertaining the pervasion. So those are the two we've just talked about, one and two. So you find the object of negation, yeah? Rather than negating it, you find it. That's what it means to ascertain. You think, okay, this one that feels true and solid, this identity, I found you, even though I know better, I'm holding it. And then you say, the pervasion, it pervades that, this is logic and debate terminology, either this self is one with its parts or it's separate from its parts. If it exists, those are the only two ways it can exist. And stay there for a minute. Are there alternatives? If this, you know, self-sufficient, substantially existent, truly existent, inherently existent identity, identity is really there, then it's either something that is the same as or different from its components. Is that a fair enough way to think? You just really sit with, okay, are there other possibilities than that? You think, okay, yeah, I'm sort of on board with that. Let's drop down then into the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed 
is not the same as its basis of imputation. So the self is labeled on the basis. That doesn't mean the self is the basis. But it's easy to think that. Yeah, you think, okay, I'm the parts, I'm the collection of parts. That's me, that's me, I'm the collection. And you say, okay, what's the problem with that? Is there a problem with thinking I am the collection? First of all, do you even know your whole collection <laughs> of parts upon parts upon parts? Second of all, are how many of those parts are actually permanent? Each of them are changing moment to moment. Influenced by inner, influenced by outer, influenced by karma, influenced by so many millions of things. And you think, okay, it seems reasonable to think I am the basis, but actually conventional eye is just labeled on the basis. Do you see the way in which that's more subtle? Yeah, and so then you move to the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed is not different from its basis. Think, okay, well, if I'm not existing in amongst it, I'm on top of it. Interesting. Feels that way. The owner of my experience. It feels like I'm the owner of my experience or I am the experiencer. There is experience, but there is not ownership in that sense. Yeah. Then the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed is not dependent on its basis of imputation, meaning it's not inherently dependent. Yeah, it's not inherently dependent. Um, it doesn't, uh, there's not like a, a tie or a cord or tape, you know, connecting the two of you intrinsically. What is imputed and the basis of imputation are related to each other, but they're not inherently related to each other. The essential of realizing that phenomena imputed is not the support upon which its basis of imputation are dependent. Yeah, not the support. Yeah, not the foundation. And then the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed does not possess its basis. Yeah, there's no owner there. Realizing that phenomena is not the mere collection of its basis of imputation. That's getting quite subtle, right? Because we can think that, okay, now I've got it. I'm, I'm the mere collection. Yeah, that label is the mere collection of its basis of imputation, its parts, its causes and conditions, etc. That's That's it. But it's not. And you go the essential of realizing that the phenomena imputed is not the shape of its basis of imputation. And, you know, this is, you know, like the outline or the, um, the structure of it or the physicality of it or the, you know, kind of movement within it or, you know, there's a lot of different ways to think about this. But all of these, you know, seven core ones can be its own meditation. You don't have to go through all of them and they're not necessarily linear. The first two, you know, the preliminaries in yellow there, the object to be negated and the pervasion, those have to come first. But the rest of them can go in any order and can get any kind of emphasis depending on what's really striking a chord with you in terms of your own concrete feeling of identity. So when you're meeting a concrete feeling of I have been harmed, I have been helped, when you meet that, ask which one of these is making that sense of concreteness and then just sit there. And you sit there until you can at least intellectually come to this implicit tense, sta tense stage of realizing the non-inherent existence of the phenomena to be imputed. Yeah, so you come to, so it, you need to arrive at emptiness, um, at least intellectually, but if you can have even kind of a spaciousness or a dissolvingness, you know, that's, that's not realizing emptiness, but it's starting to move in that direction. You also might have a sense of fear or a sense of loss or a sense of groundlessness, which is indicating going in the right direction. Fear of destruction, fear of annihilation um, is a good sign and it won't last forever, but it's quite you know, confronting to, to be like, who, there is no self, the one that I've always thought of as me isn't there at all. What, what is left? Well, there is many things left, but none of them are self. <laughs> Many things are left, just none of them are self. 
Then, so, uh, yeah, me. yeah, yeah. Uh, could you say something about the uh, relation of realizing emptiness and uh, dealing with karma? For, you, for your own sake or for the other, never mind. Can you say it again? Like, assuming that you understand the emptiness, some, some flavor of it, okay? Yeah. And you are not dwelling on who you are, what you are, but you do react to karma. And you want to get rid of this, of the imprints of the karma to change, okay? Mm -hmm. So how this, because this is a concrete, I don't know, feeling, which is maybe as a ignorance, but you do feel like you feel it, okay? So how, uh, realizing emptiness can help you uh, to deal with karma, to get rid of karma, or not superficially, but... Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's, it's essential that we acknowledge what we're experiencing. It's essential, we have to start there. But to say, I feel what I feel, I experience what I experience, is different than saying, I believe it, you know? So emptiness gives you the space to say, despite feeling this, I question its reality. You know, just like that old analogy they always give of if you're walking down the path at twilight and you see a coiled rope, but you think it's a snake, you will be just as afraid as if it actually were a snake. So the fact that you're afraid doesn't make it true, but still you feel fear. You know, and so knowing emptiness helps you dissolve the reactivity of your karma. So whatever you experience, you experience. You have compassion for yourself. You help, you understand the human condition. You, you know, do kind things to yourself, blah, blah, blah. At the same time, emptiness makes you not believe what your karmic predispositions and karmic tendencies and karmic habits say is the conclusion or the reality of what you feel and experience. You question the relationship between feeling and truth. So you say, I do feel this way, and there are things that at my level I need to do to self-soothe or move through, but just because I feel it doesn't mean it's accurate. Vividness is not a criteria for truth. Intensity is not a criteria for truth because I can be as afraid of the rope that looks like a snake as I am of the actual snake that might hurt me. It can be equal fear because it's all in my mind of what I think is the case. So my karmic predisposition is throwing the appearance of snake onto rope just because I'm afraid doesn't make that true. But does that negate the idea of karma actually because we only assume that there is a karma? No. <laughs> not the question. The question if there are snakes, what do you do when there is really a snake there? Yeah. Concerning emptiness. Well, this is the question. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's the next label, layer down, right? So you can see the snake and have the, the karmic reactivity of I must be afraid and run because, you know, from biology and from instinct, that makes sense to do. But if you're realizing that snake and danger are not inherently existent terms, you might still run away, but without reactivity, panic, agitation, afflictions. Now you're coming from the place of wisdom that understands the relative, but is believing the ultimate. Because if you're not remembering the ultimate, you think, Danger is self-evident, self-existent. Death is the end. It's the end of me, the end of identity. It's to be avoided at all costs, when in fact, none of that exists inherently. But conventionally, this life has a certain momentum and you've learned a certain amount of things that will take a long time to relearn if you were to die now and have to start back at baby and adolescence and everything. So you might as well stay alive. Yeah, you might as well stay alive. So don't step on the snake but you know that all of the projections you have about snakeness are not self-existent. And the, the, the conclusion of all that is lack of agitated mind, 
lack of labeling of danger equaling destruction of peace. It doesn't mean you stop labeling that is dangerous. It just means labeling dangerous doesn't now agitate the mind. Not remembering emptiness is why we're agitated in response to our labels. If we understood that our labels are dependently arisen, we could still have them, but we would have them lightly without reactivity. And you know, the ability to change and shift given more information would come much more fluidly and flexibly. So, you know, so we have karmic habits and karmic predispositions and karmic seeds ripening constantly. Our work is to challenge our habit of belief. And that's how we use emptiness. Yeah, just because it seems so, even though it's always been so, is it as true as I've always thought it to be? How is it not? Where is the selfness in it? The selfness in me? It's, it's a razor's edge, yeah? So understanding karmic cause and effect makes you ethical. Understanding emptiness doesn't undermine that, but it's as if it could. And it's so close. That's why it's this razor's edge. There's so many teachings about the way in which cause and effect and dependent arising complement, but don't contradict the understanding of emptiness. And that is something we have to sit with again and again. It's not a simple experience to come to. Because if you say in emptiness, there is no good or bad and happy in, in emptiness, there is no happiness and suffering. That means no happiness and suffering from its own side, no good or bad in and of itself divorced from context it doesn't mean nothing. It means not alone. It not it means not by its nature. You know, I think that we, we all know that some of the worst, most heartbreaking moments of our life have been the most important and have been the greatest gift, even though they were not intended as a gift. <laughs> even though we did not want them, they wound up being the very thing that we needed. Was it good or bad in and of itself? If we're talking to a trauma survivor in front of us, we're not going to say, let's look at this as a path to transformation in the first second. Of course not. In the first moment, you have to just be empathic and compassionate and, you know, be with that until the level of agitation can settle down for some more exploration. But as years go by and perspective increases, there can be an almost gratitude in the worst of our life. So was it good or was it bad? It was neither, it was both. Because in emptiness, none of it in and of itself. It could be the thing that destroyed us. It could be the thing that empowered us. We know that already. But why is that possible? Because it's empty. If it, was, if it wasn't empty, bad things could only be bad. Pain would only be pain. There would be no nuance. There would be no shift. There would be no ability to reframe. You know. So you say that the capacity to transform is emptiness. Because things are empty, there is the capacity to transform. So whether you start with the self or whether you start with your experience or whether you start with your projections of the other or you start with, you know, something that's a bit neutral, like a chariot or a car, it really depends on kind of what you need in your practice and how, how stable you can remain while being confronted. And that's something that changes day to day because there's so many conditions involved. So when you're doing this, this meditation, um, of course, using the self is really useful and powerful, but there are some days where either it feels too much, too intense, or it's just not coming vivid because you're a bit too tired or relax that day for the self to roar into prominence, then you might need to, to use something a bit more neutral. Like, okay, so it looks like there's a car out there. Where is the car? Is it the doors? Is it the hood? Is it the carburetor? Is it the engine? Where is the car? If I took all the pieces apart, is there still a car there? And you do it with something that's just really neutral and unemotional and you don't care about because that's not going to be triggering reactivity. Yeah, and then you bring that personally and you say, Oh, am I my successes? Am I my failures? 
You know, am I this part of my ancestry or that part of my ancestry? You know, am I this level of education or this deficiency in education? You know, and you do the same process as you did with the bloody chariot and it doesn't matter with the chariot, but then you bring it home and you think, okay, all those other things are dependent arising, but this is me. And you'll find some little feeling of core or some feeling of owner, and then you found it, and then you can destroy it. And then you relax and you release after a little bit of fear first, <sighs> you know. And then you do it again, and then you do it again, and each time you do it, you're less reactive. Every time you do it, it's easier to turn that knowledge to everything else besides the self or what seems to belong to the self. And we just keep working on it. And so of those seven points, some of them will make more sense to you than others, either because you relate to them more or because they just, you know, connect more in terms of your level of understanding of the words. And any of them work, you know. So you don't have to be completely certain of every section. This is just what Chandra Kurti says is a quick and easy way of understanding emptiness, the sevenfold analysis. So whether it's quick or easy for you or not is um, something to sit with. But if it's hard, don't be scared. I mean, that's maybe one that you haven't tried yet. And that might be the very gateway to opening your next level of understanding. So if you meet one of these points and you're thinking, that one I just do not get, that could be the very one that you need because we've worked through these issues so many times in the past already, haven't we? We've looked at the nature of the self from a lot of angles. So um, when you're looking through the sevenfold analysis, there's only so much we can do together. There's only so much I can walk you through. This really has to be you yourself sitting with these points and thinking deeply about them. You know, there's only so much that um, from the outside going in. Yeah, and, um, and it's hard to move forward with the conversation until we've all sat with them a little bit to even have doubts, you know. So please do sit with them. And um, if questions come up down the track in subsequent semesters and subsequent life, if you in 10 years go to a Geshe teaching and they're teaching on Chandrakirti sevenfold reasoning and then something connects, you know, you can email any of your nuns. Your nuns have your back, you know. So anyway, like this, don't think it's, it's not the end of the conversation, right? It's a new beginning to it. Yeah. Um, yes, are we done? We're done, aren't we? Okay. So um, see you at what? Clinical seminar and then meditation after. Okay. Just processing. Dedicating. Thank you, Yonten. Thanks, guys. <laughs>